Let's give it up for our next keynote speaker. My name is Ravi. Sahil is over there. Sahil is the founder of uh, uh, Rishod University. Uh, before I start, uh, because um, it's such a detailed intro, it's almost embarrassing. I'm, uh, I'm at least uh, 12 or 14 years older than you, Sahil, right? So, so I'm not future-proof. Sahil is future-proof. He's a founder. He's an IDN. And of all the things um, uh, which uh, an IDN would like to do, and there are a lot of IDNs in uh, Bangalore who are building great companies. And as a venture capitalist, I meet and, uh, and I talk to them, um, several of them, almost on a daily basis. Uh, Sahil uh, basically chose uh, to build a university, and, then, and not, not like pseudo online university or something. He wanted to build buildings, he wanted to create a new culture, he wanted to future-proof India's education and all this. And let me tell you one thing, he's not doing it alone, he's actually doing it one of the most seasoned politicians India has seen, Suresh Prabhuji. So a politician and an IED graduate come together and they want to do that. And uh, venture capitalists are, um, are, are greedy people, greedy in a good sense, bad sense, and so how can I not uh, uh, use this opportunity? It's a privilege. Um, uh, and an honor uh, to be part of what's happening in India. And education is, is the, the problem which we have to solve. And it's a bigger problem than even poverty in India. Believe me, not believe me, I certainly believe uh, this thing. But tailwinds are in our favor. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, uh, India's solutions to its own problem will become global postulate. So if you believe in that, then, uh, then you will enjoy this particular talk. And if you don't believe in that, I hope I would be able to change few of the, few of the mindsets which are there. But, but thank you for having me. This is me. <clears throat> uh, I'm, in, first two, in, in first two slides, I will actually put my credibility uh, over here that why you should listen uh, to me. All of you are young. India's demography is on the other side of my age. So, so, so each one of you should ask question. Time is the most precious commodity. Each one of you should ask question, why should, why should I listen? Why should I put my time? So first two slides for that. Uh, and, and someone, uh, uh, and somewhere to put my credibility. And then, uh, and then two things I'll talk about based upon my last 32 years of uh, designing and building things and building companies and investing in companies and all that stuff. But thank you, Sahil. Uh, for building uh, Rishihood and, and, and continue to build uh, Rishihood. Hopefully, uh, we will uh, not only create uh, 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 a future uh, for India, but it will become a global postulate uh, uh, for education anywhere and everywhere in, uh, anywhere and everywhere in the world. Uh, I do four things. I, I used to work for large companies. Uh, my last corporate job, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the Founders of Vistara. Vistara has been sold to Air India. Now it is part of Air India. Uh, me, P Tech, and Leslie P Tech was the first CEO. Leslie was the second CEO. Three of us, uh, along with our team, we basically built an airline and took it from zero to a billion dollar. That was my last job. And uh, uh, so, where my money comes, my money basically comes. I'm an engineer. I've got 38 patents, 17 of the royalties I get out of those patents. So they, they give me some work. So I'm still valid. I'm old, but I'm still valid. There are people who actually buy my work even today. So my first credibility. Second, I'm an aviator. I fly aircraft. So when, uh, when I'm running out of cash, I do missions. I do rescue missions. I've done over 1,000 rescue missions uh, across, uh, across, across the globe. Uh, someone from Red Cross, someone beyond, uh, beyond, uh, beyond Red Cross. I work very closely with Indian Space Agency and uh, Indian Air Force uh, and Red Cross. My third thing which I, which, I, um, uh, which I do is as an investor, and I've been reasonably good uh, as an investor because I invest in things which I know. Now I have got a little bit of courage 
to invest in things which I don't know, and that's a fascinating uh, a journey. So I'm, in a way, I'm a coward also. Uh, I was coward for most part of my life. Now I'm getting some, some, uh, some bravery uh, in this. And the last one is, I learn from uh, people like uh, Sahil, uh, and I'm trying to understand what would be the definition of education for India. Uh, this is my credibility. <clears throat> These are the brands uh, with whom I have worked. Top one in gray were my employers. As you said, last, my last employer was Tata Sons, Vistara. But in between, the design, since UX is, is core to uh, 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 this stage today, uh, there, are, there are two institutions which actually educated me what, um, what design is and what UX in particular is. One is Wyden Kennedy, you can see that. It's one of the agencies in the world. And second, of course, is Nike. I spent six years at Nike's Beaverton World uh, Campus, and I learned. And I was one of the creative guys who actually built NikeID.com. NikeID.com doesn't exist now. Uh, because it has been merged into Nike.com, uh, Nike but it was one first thing which created a revolution that you can design your own shoe, and then people started designing their motorcycle cars, etc., etc. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one uh, lesson which still continues. And then mistakes, okay? Uh, and now, now I can talk openly about those mistakes, so I'll talk about a lot of dot-coms which, uh, which I have built. And then I graduated in terms of building engines, building aircrafts, designing aircrafts, et cetera, et cetera, and what are my learnings. But this is to put my credibility on, on, on the table that I know a little bit about uh, UX. I, I know a little bit about uh, uh, design. So, I, so, the, so, the, so, so one mistake and one lesson, and that would be all about uh, 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 today's talk. Just one mistake and one less, uh, lesson. Uh, some people actually live their life uh, with zero mistakes and, and, and many lessons, or zero lessons. I'm a little bit lucky I've done, I'll talk about one mistake and one lesson. Nike ID, <coughs> this was a lesson. And, and now the talk really starts. One of the biggest lessons which I learned when I was young, by the way, I'm not that old, I'm 48. Uh, but I was very, very young when I was uh, part of the team which was building it. One of the biggest lessons uh, which, I, which, I, which I learned is that UX cannot be siloed. And that mistake almost everyone does again and again and again, even today. Uh, you look at unicorns in Bangalore, whether they are retail organization or they are designing some, some kind of machine, they sit, they have coffees, they have their own team, they have their own ecosystem, and it still happens. UX in silo has a shelf life and it expires very quickly and that's the mistake and I will showcase some of the mistakes. I'll explain about those mistakes and that continues to happen. I was a little bit blessed, I was lucky that UX has to converge with what people call it a CX. At that time we used to call it consumer or customer experience which has to be core. That has to be fuel. That, ha that is the only thing which will give longevity to any, anything which you are designing, specifically UX. And now it is becoming far more complex and far more simple at the both time, at, 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 at the same time, because there are multiple channels and those multiple channels have to converge. But customer is quite simple in a sense that they use that same technology which exists in enterprises today or in existing companies. So in, in one way it is very, very simple, but that's a mistake. Uh, Nike ID was not created out of a great UX. Nike ID was, a, was created because the brand of Nike basically said that if you are really, really interested in my products, then you have to play sports. And if you want to play sports, uh, sports you are as much an athlete as Pete Sampras or Tiger Woods are. I'm born in that particular era. I don't know the athletes nowadays. Virat Kohli, I don't know whether Nike endorsed him or not. Uh, but, 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 but if you are playing that particular, then you, are, you can create your own brand. So self-esteem of every customer became a central, central point, focal point of customer design, customer discussion, customer attributes, customer fulfillment. And why not UX? How can you design a UX which will be in a catalog form, very, very nice looking, with great colors, all the templates, all the specifications, all the channels, et cetera, et cetera. 
but you are not making your customer the central point. And that is one of the biggest lessons. That's why the Nike ID was born. You can create your own colors. You can pick your own colors with the limitation of technology, of course, at that particular time. And you can create your own. You can put your own name on your shoe. In the swoosh, you can actually create your own color of shoe and you can write your name underneath. And that was the real core. And that principle still exists and will continue to exist till the human civilization keeps on building products for others and those others continue to pay that individual money for the experience which they do. Pay money or not pay money is a... And then the mistakes. I was also part of the core teams. All these examples are Western examples. I get my own pleasure. Most of my initial body of work actually came out of US and a little bit out of uh, France. Um, I was part of there, but look at, uh, look at them, look at, um, you know, I, I don't want to be controversial, but if you go, go to any UX evaluation website, none of, none of these uh, channels, uh, whether they are on mobile, whether they are on, uh, on, on classical uh, uh, website mode, they don't give them even two and a half uh, out of five ranking. And one of the reasons they don't do that and while their stores still operate, their store, they keep on changing uh, their stores, they keep on branding the stores, they keep on designing their aisles, but the interface is still not there. And the reason why it's not there is that fundamental mistake. Somewhere, somewhere from, everyone talks about convergence of a physical world into a digital world. But the thinking, because the teams are very, very different. The store managers are not part of UX team. UX team goes and they interviews them, but they are not critical. They don't think like that, okay? Uh, and similarly, UX guys don't operate stores. They don't participate in operations of their stores. One of the fundamental, one of the fundamental learnings when I was setting up an airline, not only me, the whole leadership of uh, Tata Singapore Airlines, Vistara, uh, we were, we were not very successful in first three quarters of operation of an airline. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you guys have traveled with Sara. Uh, interiors used to be very, very different. In fact, very, very, very plush, very, very, very rich when we actually uh, uh, started an airline. And customers were not coming. They were just not coming. And according to us, it was great. Great seats, great food. In fact, we used to give five course meal. And then the common sense appeared somewhere. Sometimes it comes late. Talk to your customer, understand what your customers are. Delhi Mumbai flight, which is about roughly about two hours, in fact, less than flight time. Why would somebody, people don't fly airlines for a five course meal. They don't, okay. They just don't. Uh, so we actually sat, sat on a counter. We actually sat on counters selling tickets. CEO, CTO, CCO, CFO was, and C CFO didn't fancy that. Uh, most leadership, they, we actually, and we learned what customers want, and sometimes that's very, very important. But you just go, don't go and interview customers. You basically experience directly what your customer feel, and, and that fundamentally changed. And then Vistara is, was Vistara today. It's one of the most successful, or used to be one of the most successful airline. And that's the same fundamental mistake which everyone does, even today. The digital world and the physical world, and somewhere digital, and specifically UX folks, their understanding and their depth of customer experience or their depth in terms of thinking of customer experience is lacking. And it's not lacking over here uh, in India. World over it lacks. And most of the channels, digital channels, are still highly, highly mediocre. We sell them, but highly, highly mediocre. And disasters do happen. I don't know how many people even know there used to be a company known as, a very, very successful company known as Hollywood Videos. Based out of Oregon, I spent a lot of time in Oregon, and suddenly it just failed, gone bust. Vibrant, great stores, great business. There were different reasons. But one of the main reasons was this shelf life of understanding customers. So if businesses can go bust, and the reason why I have given this highlight, I will encourage everyone to understand how UX or how lack of uh, connection of UX to CX, customer experience, 
actually made this come. There were very reasons, various reasons why this company went bust, but this was one of the core reasons. Very well documented, so I will strongly encourage. So sometimes this can be dangerous. And specifically now, when the bridge doesn't exist between the gadgets or the technology stack, what a consumer has and what you are using at enterprise. The bridge doesn't exist, and that bridge doesn't exist. They want that same seamless experience. What OEMs or people who are selling this technology directly, they are giving for the, for example, if an Apple or a Samsung or anyone, they are giving a certain kind of experience to people who are holding their phones. And if you can't match that kind of experience, then I'm sorry you will struggle, your design will struggle. It will work for some period of time. It will, can, the worst case scenario can happen if your, most of your revenues are directly dependent upon uh, 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 your digital channel, then businesses and companies can shut down. And this will happen mostly in services sector. It's already happening, by the way. And even then, even then, UX is still not. I sit on various uh, boards of various companies, large and small. Still UX is not a board uh, discussion. CX is. Still UX is not a board discussion because evangelism, the silo thinking, the connection of UX in terms of margins, the revenue coming in, that thinking still lacks. So the only way for an effective UX to be legitimate in their existence and to, 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 to be valid rather than being validated always is that there has to be a very, very strong convergence between these two. Now, this is the engineer in me who is talking. We are living in a world where empathy will be the only differentiator. Difference between one bank versus another bank, mostly regulated, most things will be same. One retailer versus another retailer, supply chain costs, unit economics of supply chain will be almost same. Empathy, how you treat your customer, how you treat your own employees, because it starts from within. Education may be a little bit different, but in the end, because it's a journey, it's still, it's, still, it's still on the journey, very, very initial stage of journey. It's not matured, per se. Uh, uh, but ultimately, it will uh, all happen. And most of the purpose or the fulfillment of purpose will happen through intelligent machines. Now, I may stretch, or I, it, it may seem like that I'm stretching the envelope a little bit uh, further, because I am, uh, uh, my specialization is robotics. But I see that happening uh, in almost every service uh, uh, sector. And I'm not glorifying neither robotics nor AI. In fact, I don't talk much about AI. But still, certain things are far-fetched. One of the examples is a robot which me and my team created. We actually understood that cabin crew and most people who work as cabin crew in an aircraft, they actually don't relish their job. Hence, you see the energy seeping out of them after the longevity of service. And that's why some of the very smart airlines, basically, they say that, hey, there's a shelf life for a cabin crew job or something like that. The reason is not about age or something like that. The reason is that most people don't enjoy it. And, and, and there are examples which are coming uh, out of uh, service industries. I don't want to name a particular industry just to sound controversial, but, 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 but since it's a pretty diverse group, um, whether it is IT services, whether it is banking, whether it is business process outsourcing, uh, whether it is uh, uh, airport customer services, etc., etc. In fact, some of the smartest, and it's a very well uh, case study, it's a, uh, a Stanford case study, uh, uh, again, not naming an airline, it's a low-cost airline. They give much more better service by not having people interact with their customers. In fact, machines are interacting with their, uh, with their customers. They, they focus on the other aspects of uh, problems which customers face. So that's going to happen. This is a little bit of self-glorification. About 14 years back, I actually wrote a code, which is codification of uh, emotions. And I said that, look, you know, uh, most customer interactions which will, uh, or most con uh, conversations which are happening on internet, they're random. But if randomness can be removed, 
and the emotions of that can be, con can be converted into some kind of an a customer experience people will be able to pay. For example, if you wear a Brooks Brothers suit, and if I know that you are a Brooks Brothers customer, then I can make an inference out of your emotions and then say that you can actually buy a billion dollar apartment or you, should, you, are, you are a good contender to fly business class or first class if you're an airline, et cetera, et cetera. And I use this in my airline. In fact, most of our loyalty card base was actually created out of this particular algorithm and then I sold it to one of the largest software companies and made tons of money. Uh, so, so by the way, if you're able to converge UX into a customer experience, you can actually create some, some, some of the most potent codification which will happen in future and, and on the way make um, tons of money if you're interested in wealth. But today there's only one differentiation, only one differentiation which is empathy and empathy everywhere. Empathy in a physical world, empathy in a virtual world or in a digital world, much more in a digital world much, much, much more in our digital world and the ecosystem. For example, last mile delivery workers, what vehicle they do, how they are treated, how they are given incentives, how they approach you, how they ring the bell, how they deliver the services, do you know them, how much do you know them, what kind of products they are delivering, what time they are delivering, etc., etc. All of them, very, what do they wear? And then the codification of empathy is happening. As I said, I'm already 48. This is the, one of the last bets which I'm making in terms of wealth creation for myself. And I firmly believe that in the next 14 to 20 years, we'll see codification of, uh, of, of emotions, of empathy, sorry. Hence, I encourage and I strongly urge, uh, and we do that uh, in, in our university, to deeply understand and apply neuroplasticity. Deeply understand what neuroplasticity is. It is one of the oldest signs and it is one of the oldest physical nature's gift, nature's gift to imbibe and experience into an impact. And it starts with the birth. Anyone who has been to any neonatal center or any hospital where kids are kept after they are, uh, after they are born, there's one phenomena which almost every serious developer in this world is, is thinking and, and trying to imbibe in their, in their engineering, in their code, is when a single child in a group of children, when they cry, and especially when they are at a very, very, very new age, everyone else cries. Everyone else. No reason. How does it happen? Why does it happen? Imagine if you are able to codify that, if you can understand that, and if you can put that in your UX and connect that UX to your customer experience and make that as a tangible benefit out of your brand, imagine how much market you can capture. Just imagine how much market you can capture. Stickiness with your customers will go many times. People who will become your consumer and customer at the unit cost of marketing will be unimaginable. And that's what design teams have to think about. They have to get out of this normal tendencies of design specifications, design drivers, design fuel elements, and all the stuff. They have to really think about how business is driven, not enabled, driven by creating great customer experiences which are impactful, which is the next stage. These are the walls of Rishiwood University. Our inspiration, of course, is Vivekananda, but these are the walls of Rishiwood University. And, 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 and I would strongly urge, and if I uh, should talk to Sahil, come to university, see the walls of Rishiwood University. It's a beautiful convergence of digital and physical world. It's a extremely beautiful, uh, and that's what we try to teach our students, that we live in digital uh, and physical world, and we have to continuously think about experiences and our walls, hopefully, 
that's an aspirational statement, um, uh, Sahil. Our walls whisper empathy. Everyone is a founder, everyone is a contributor, everyone is an enabler, everyone is a driver, everyone, students are teachers, teachers are students, uh, designer is a mechanic, mechanic is an engineer, engineer is a technician. Everyone in Rishi Yod University, we breathe empathy. Because, not because we are nice people, because we think that's the only way to make it future-proof, and that's a very profitable way of making it future-proof, by the way. It's, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm a hardcore capitalist. That's the most profitable way of, uh, <laughs> of, of making money. Nurture and nature. Understand from nature, codify it, nurture your customers, build great companies, make them lasting as long as creativity lives. Hopefully those companies will have enough cash flow and one day you will be obsolete but you will have enough cash so that you can actually buy creativity from outside and that's what happens when companies turn unicorns, they buy other companies hopefully, but reach there first. And this is one of the methods of uh, 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 reaching over there. I have just three odd minutes left. This is me if anyone wants to connect with me, but open for questions. We have time for two questions if it is allowed, and then meet Sahib, founder of Rishiro. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yes. Please introduce yourself, then the question. Hi, Ravi. Uh, amazing presentation. Uh, I'm Vivian Gomes. I come from San Francisco, but I'm an Indian here. Yeah. Uh, my question to you is, beautiful things that you spoke about, and just for the general audience, you know, I hear many versions of empathy. You're, you're, you're to the point, but could you explain your opinion or your learnings on what empathy could be? Just the word empathy. Itself. I'll give examples. Look, I'm as good as my founders. As I said, look, you know, I pretend to be intelligent, but look, my IQ has been down for a very, very long time. My experience make me look very nice and all the stuff because those experience carry. But uh, my creative work uh, uh, juices. I'll give you examples. I give you examples. First, Richard University. Uh, you know, but Sahil is there. Sahil, meet Sahil. You know why he created that? It's a fascinating story. It's a seriously fascinating story. But I'll give you concrete examples. I'll try to give examples uh, 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 from uh, Bangalore. There's a company known as Chara, okay? I, I uh, uh, you know, uh, founders, I've started with Chara because I, I don't want to give an impression that everyone who is 48 year old is as dumb as me. They are all older than me, but they created Chara. They have created, there are only four companies in this world who have actually designed uh, switch reluctance motors. Switch reluctance motors, I'll not get into technicalities. They are very powerful motors with the same energy they can actually give more power. There are restrictions of that particular power in the sense vibration is very high noises, but they have, the biggest one by the way is very near to a place where you come, the company name is Turntoid, but Turntide. But this company, they not only created uh, 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 switch reluctance motors and series of them, they made it rare earth free their empathy come, and I'll come in that sequence because that's how we think in. Their empathy was towards their own country. They understood the geopolitics and restriction of India f with respect to rare earth metals, and they said, we will solve this particular problem whatsoever. Both founders, one is one of the founding design heads. He actually designed Reva, people who are Indian and, and are industry automobile. Uh, Reva was the first electric uh, uh, car which was designed in India, and he was a designer. But both of these guys, they were senior leadership in one of some of the large companies in US. They came over here, empathy was towards their country, and that fueled them to create Chara. Okay, so that's the empathy at the highest level, where you say that, look, I love my country, not patriotism, I differentiate with them. They were, they were very happy. They have lived most of their life in, in states, but they wanted to come over because they understood what the problem, and they knew that rare earth metals are not going to come, material is not going to come, and periodic table is not in favor of India. So why not create? So, so that's one example, which is the highest level, one of the most subjective ones, one of the most difficult ones to imbibe, but they created that. 
The last one, I'll just do, just to be, so this is a Bangalore company. The last one, and there are several companies in between. The last one which I'll give you is a company known as Baz. It's an IIT Delhi company. This was incubated out of Indian Institute of Science and, uh, and Purdue University in US, the first Chara. And the second one was IIT Delhi. Four founders, uh, younger than, in fact, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the founders is, I think, uh, four years younger to you, uh, IIT Delhi, same batch, uh, same, uh, same uh, uh, four years of curriculum. And he was touched by the last mile workers' effort to earn their income. Okay. And I'm very careful because this is a very, very emotional subject, full of empathy, but emotional. They're very, very young kids. They understood, the economics. they understood the economics of the last mile worker was not in the favor. Most of them, they come from different states. They come to India. They don't have a house. They basically spend money and they have literally no savings for, uh, uh, for, for their future. And then there are areas in Delhi like Green Park where they were using classical fuel-based um, heavy vehicles and they were not able to control the phone on which the orders were coming and, and the goods which were supposed to be delivered in the bag, where to keep the bag, etc., etc. Some of them were using bicycles. And if anyone has been to Delhi, the steepness and the, most of them didn't have time to basically, or, or money, to basically have us a little bit of beverage, etc., etc. So these guys design a vehicle which, which last mile worker can not only operate, but it is designed for them where you place the phone, where you place the bag, lightweight, can go up, can go down, brakes, and but they created the ecosystem where they can refuel. Almost every battery uh, uh, which, which, which they use and reuse has got a beverage one, they can use that, they pay for it, but they can use it, etc., etc. So that is the empathy. And the last one, just to close that, the buzzer is out, time is up, but the last one is my own example. Look, I, I was a fancy silk suit person, you know, I've, you know, I've done mergers, I had made money, before that I was, I, I built a large business, and when I came to an airline, I was, I was, I wanted to learn, but I wanted to make my name, and I was, it was very hard for me to understand just what customers really want uh, from an airline. Frankly, to be very honest, I didn't even understood what point the actual experience starts. Does it start when you book your ticket on your own? Does it start from your agent? Does it start when you are at a curb of an airport? Does, you, does it start when you are at a counter? Does it start when you are at security? Does it start when you are at a gate? Does it start when you are sitting in your seat? Does it start when the food is served? Does it when you don't know. Maybe everything. And then you basically make a practicality out of that particular empathy that what makes sense in terms of business and the regulatory practicality. And I was again one of the, one of the earlier ones um, uh, to learn, but I forgot my Nike story in between because you know money can and wealth can do strange things to you. But Vistara actually showed me uh, that uh, if you really want to be successful in today's world, you need to make empathy especially for your customers. And one of the biggest learning which I learned, that if you are not empathetic, especially if you are in a leadership position, if you believe in sort of leadership, if you are not empathetic, uh, uh, if you don't have an empathy towards your own employees, towards your own suppliers, towards your own ecosystem, then you cannot even put a pretense or pretend an empathy towards your customer. It doesn't happen. So three examples. Hopefully, I have answered. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. It was nice. We don't have. I thought two questions. This is otherwise. Yeah. We are good. Thank you.